The Amulet by Michael McDowell. I'd also like to give a shout out to At Venn's Book Corner and The Bookworm because I ended up reading The Amulet now for the third time in a couple of years and each time it's an amazing read but this time I did it for Don't Die July. Be sure to check out that hashtag to see what other novels people are reading if you're looking for a great horror read. I've done a video about the author, Michael McDowell himself. There's a number of interesting facts about him. As far as the amulet, the one thing that I will say is if you don't enjoy gruesome details in your death scenes, you should probably not read the amulet. He's talking about extended optic nerves and he's pretty detailed in what happens. So it's a bit funny that I've enjoyed the amulet. I highly recommend if you enjoy a horror story with a little paranormal twist. And I think for me, this I enjoy because of the paranormal aspect. When I was doing the March Mystery Madness, I read two of the Scarpetta collection. And that I didn't enjoy because it was as graphic and detailed as McDowell. But the difference is that was based a little more on real events versus McDowell, you know, is just making it up. So I don't know. For me, that was just that fine line because, as I say, I've now read The Amulet three times in three years, and each time I've enjoyed the read, and there's new things to pick up about the different characters. The story itself is set in Pinecone, Alabama, a small town. The main employer there is the Pinecone Munitions Factory. You have to keep in mind when you're reading this the time period that it was written in. So it's during the Vietnam War. Segregation is still a thing in that community. And men were being drafted to go over to Vietnam and fight in the war. Our story begins with Dean Howell, a resident of Pinecone who's been drafted to go fight in the Vietnam War. He's at training camp and talking to another man who's been drafted, Simon, and mentioning that you can basically see the Pinecone Munitions Factory if you stood a little higher up at their training camp. He shares that he ended up being drafted, although his friend Larry Copage is high up at the factory. He didn't get him a job before he ended up being drafted. So Simon's asking, you know, well, why didn't he do that? And there really isn't an answer. But Dean does share that his wife, Sarah, was given a job by Larry, kind of to try and make things up. And in a way, that's comforting to Dean because the rifles they're using have been made at this factory. There's a little pine cone on the end of the gun. You can tell I'm not a gun person. Shortly after, he shares that thought with Simon. They're called onto the range. They're getting ready to take aim and fire. Suddenly, there's a big sound and screaming. Simon looks over to see Dean covering, well, what was his face, and blood gushing everywhere. As I said, Michael McDowell doesn't leave anything to the imagination when it comes to what's happened in terms of injuries. We then go to Pinecone itself. Sarah's working on the line. She lives with her mother-in-law, Joe Howell. Unfortunately, because prior to being drafted, Dean 
wasn't exactly employment material. Prior to going to training camp, he'd been out with his buddies, imbibed a little too much, crashed their car, but didn't tell Sarah before he left. So she unfortunately found out after. In order to get to her job at the factory, Sarah gets a ride with her friend Becca, who is also her next door neighbor. As I mentioned, Dean wasn't employment material, had quite a temper and other issues. Unfortunately, that meant that he and Sarah ended up going to live with his mother, Joe Howell, in town. Joe and Sarah are not what you would call close for a multitude of reasons. Joe herself is lazy, vindictive, and does nothing. Sarah, on the other hand, works at the factory five days a week. She comes home, she prepares the meals, she cleans the house, she does the shopping, she does the cleaning, and whenever she tries to mention something to Joe about helping out, Joe reminds her that she's living rent-free, so this is her way of making up for that. Of course, Joe doesn't mention the fact that it's Sarah's salary that's paying the bills, buying the food. But as I say, Joe is not a very likable character for a multitude of reasons. On page 26, we learn a bit about Joe and her past. When she was only eight years old, her parents died in a house fire. Joe was not in the house. She then went to live with an elderly cousin. Some people thought that cousin had some mental issues. When Joe was 16, her cousin walked into the Burnt Corn Creek and died. What seemed particularly odd to the people in town is that this particular cousin had told anyone who would listen how much she hated and feared running water. And yet here she was in her 87th year and walked into the creek. A bit bizarre, but certainly not the only bizarre death that happens around Joe. Shortly after her cousin's death, Joe marries Jim Howell. He's a farmer. Joe is, as I said, not highly motivated to do much of anything, but she did work on the farm. Now, oddly enough, I'm not quite sure why Joe decided to marry a farmer, but she did. Originally, he had been raising cotton, but Joe complained so much about having to bend over and tend the plants that he switched the crops to corn, which was less profitable. It seems to have taken Joe a bit of time, but after 17 years, she figured out that if she had a child, she wouldn't have to work in the field as much, so they had their son, Dean. Unlike Joe, who is not physically fit, not really into doing much of anything, but did manage to take care of the house somewhat, Dean had grown up to be vital and strong, helped out a lot on the farm. Then, oddly enough, and again, as I say, this seems to happen a lot with Joe, her husband mysteriously died one day. And I say mysteriously because throughout the novel, her story changes about whether he was in the field bitten by a snake or whether he was near the river fishing and bitten by something else. Like I say, Joe is an unusual character. Joe moved into town. This is the house that she now shares with Sarah. After the accident, Dean is initially kept at the training camp and the doctors tend to him. Sarah gets notified about the accident and gets a ride from Becca to go see him. When she sees Dean, of course, his face is all bandaged up. 
the prognosis doesn't seem to be good and they're not sure what if any brain damage has occurred because he hasn't spoken during this time. Eventually Dean is brought home to Pinecone because Sarah has no vehicle to take him for appointments. The doctor agrees to stop by during his trip past Pinecone. Once Dean is brought home, he needs pretty much full-time care as he does nothing for himself and he's nonverbal. Throughout the novel, we find out that he can walk somewhat as he can be led outside to sit in the shade. He goes from the bed to the living room couch where he's propped up with pillows and things. And I found that a bit unusual because there's nothing else that he does for himself. So he needs to be cleaned up. He needs to be fed. He needs to be bathed. He needs to be dressed. So I found it a bit unusual that he would have some kind of mobility. That was my one questionable thing about how this story played out. As I mentioned, Sarah was working full time. Now, on top of everything else she had already been doing at home, she's coming home to take care of Dean. Basically, Jo spends her day sitting with him hemming her own dresses, but she doesn't do anything else around the house. She doesn't prepare the meals. She doesn't really do much of anything for Dean other than talk to him. When Sarah mentions, you know, perhaps she could help dress him or bathe him or do such things, Joe's comment is always, well, you're his wife and that's your job. It's not my place as his mother to do that. Joe always seems to have some kind of excuse or rationale for essentially doing nothing. What Joe does manage to do is get the lunch dishes out to the kitchen sink. So when Sarah's returning home from work, she's coming to a sink full of dishes from lunch. Then she has dinner to prepare those dishes to clean up and just basically everything else to do meaning things, of course, have started badly as Sarah's marriage wasn't necessarily a happy one and it certainly isn't much better now and being in a house with Joe just makes it that much more difficult. The story really begins to take off when Larry Kopich stops by to visit Dean after he's come home. Joe, of course, is sitting next to Dean during the visit and Sarah's in the room. Larry apologizes for not having been able to hire Dean before he was drafted. It's a very uncomfortable visit. Joe, out of the blue, mentions that she has a gift for Larry's wife, Rachel, and it's the amulet. She says that she just thinks Rachel would enjoy it, and she hands it to Larry and tells him to be sure to give it to his wife. Larry pops it in his pocket. Sarah and Larry walk to the front door away from Joe and Dean. Larry, of course, apologizes for not having hired Dean. He had just started at the factory. He didn't know what he could and couldn't do. Sarah tells him not to worry about it. She's thankful that he gave her a job and they're able to make ends meet. Larry heads home and gives his wife the amulet. It's shortly thereafter that things go very wrong and the entire family ends up dying in a fire. Larry, his wife Rachel, and their five children. The amulet continues to move on from one person to another throughout the story. The sheriff is frustrated. He can't figure out what on earth is going on. There are these loving couples offing each other, in some cases along with their children. Sarah, early on, begins to think this amulet has something to do with it. One, because she knows what Joe is like, and all of these events started 
after Joe gave Larry the amulet. Joe also seems particularly interested in hearing about these deaths and is quite pleased as one person after another meets a gruesome end because in Joe's mind, the entire town is responsible for what happened to Dean. Sarah convinces her friend, Becca, that this amulet has something to do with all these gruesome murders suddenly occurring in the small town. They start putting the pieces together and realize the amulet has been at every single murder site. They just can't figure out how it's moving from person to person, so they're trying to find it. Sarah's telling people that it's an important object to her family, so could they let her know? But of course, as people see it, that isn't what ends up happening. The amulet itself is a bizarre piece of jewelry. As each person finds it, they notice there's no actual clasp on it. And yet when they go to put it up around their neck, suddenly it ends up being on their person and then they can't find the clasp to take it off. There's emotional things that start coming up for anyone who's wearing it. And then once the murder has happened, mysteriously the amulet just seems to fall off and be found by the next person. So it really is a bizarre piece of jewelry. As the body count is mounting, Sarah and Becca finally go talk to the sheriff. They mention their thoughts about the amulet, how it's been at all these different murder sites. The sheriff gives it some thought because he's certainly not been able to figure out what's going on and why these people are behaving so out of normal character for themselves and killing each other off. So he tells Sarah and Becca that he's going to try and figure out where this amulet is and he'll take over from there. The sheriff mentions that while they were trying to piece together the death of a man's friend, they were called to another site close by because it seems the individual had not only shot his friend point blank, but then chased this man's dog across a field. The dog, by the way, was fine. No worries there. But then this man ends up tripping into a baler and getting shredded to pieces. The sheriff is understandably quite frustrated. He can't figure out what's going on. One of his own deputies was one of the victims in this mounting body count. So the story is about these three individuals really trying to track down this amulet before it continues to kill any more people. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. The amulet makes its way to the pine cone munitions factory and things just become a massive boondoggle. Up to that point, the body count was at 16. It certainly escalates from there as it's in the factory and it isn't just workers involved. It's the upper management. It's two separate buildings. It's the area around the buildings. By some miracle, Sarah survives, gets out of the factory, gets out of a parking lot where cars are moving on their own and killing people. Sarah runs all the way home. And at first, Joe is just in her glory Everyone who has been responsible for Dean and his condition has now gotten what they deserve. Joe's in high spirits until she begins to realize that the Sarah who left for work that morning is definitely not the Sarah who has come back to the house. That, without spoilers, is basically the amulet. It keeps you on the edge the whole time because it's really mind-boggling how this amulet manages to find different people, work its way throughout the entire town, 
until finally getting itself into the munitions factory. And that in itself is rather a bizarre situation. Let me know if you've read The Amulet before and what were your thoughts. If you've enjoyed this video or you think you may enjoy reading The Amulet after listening to this video, be sure to give that like button a little tickle. Leave me a comment down below. And also, if you haven't already subscribed and you enjoy content of a bookish nature, nature videos, or silly cats, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you know when I upload content that may be of interest to you. Until next time, don't accept jewelry from strangers and take good care.